Tonight we're talking about gluten, inflammation, and the GI tract. And so I wanted to first pull up a diagram here for you on the eight ways. Now these are eight known ways that gluten can cause gastrointestinal inflammation. When I say gastrointestinal or GI tract, let's kind of define what we're talking about here. This is the tube that runs through your body from your mouth to your anus. Very important that you understand. Because a lot of people think GI tract and they think, you know, isolated to small intestine or isolated to stomach or they get, you know, caught in, in, in thinking of one particular location. But your gut, your tract itself from your mouth all the way to your anus. So anywhere along that route, we can see inflammation. We want to understand why that's there, why inflammation is there. So these are the eight ways that we are absolutely certain that, uh, that gluten can create an inflammatory process that can damage the GI tract and manifest as a number of different types of diseases. So let's, let's talk, we'll kind of go through these different ones here. Number one is canker sores. Canker sores in the mouth, sometimes referred to as aphthous ulcers or aphthous stomatitis. If you've ever had like a blister uh, that kind of that kind of pops and then kind of crevices down in the mouth, sometimes people get them on their lips. Sometimes people actually can get them on the tongue. But these types of of uh, they start out as blisters and then kind of once they pop down, they almost like an ulcer within the mouth itself. This actually a colleague of mine in in Dallas, Dr. Kenneth Fine, who runs a, a uh, an online facility called Interolab, they actually did a research study and they found that this, not only is this the number one thing that we're talking about tonight, but this was the number one symptom of people who had gluten sensitivity and didn't know it. So if you struggle chronically with canker sores, mouth sores, and you don't know why, maybe your doctor told you that this was, sometimes they'll tell you it's a herpes virus, right? Not sexually transmitted, but a herpes virus can also cause an increased frequency of mouth ulcers or mouth sores as well. But gluten, gluten is, again, a big one, and it can cause this problem to such a degree in individuals that, that when going gluten-free for many who have chronic canker sores or mouth ulcers, um, it's one of the most reported things that goes away. It's in essence, it's one of the symptoms that most commonly is reported to go away. So canker sores, mouth ulcers. Number two on the list, esophagitis, inflammation of the esophagus. And so there's a, there's a term, many of you may have heard this, some of you actually have maybe been diagnosed with this called Barrett's esophagitis. And it's when the esophagus itself becomes highly inflamed. There's another condition called EE, and this is also linked to gluten sensitivity. EE stands for eosinophilic. Let me just write that out for you. Eosinophilic esophagitis. So if you've ever heard that term, this is when eosinophils are found. So when a doctor, like a GI doctor, does a scope, and they, and they get a picture, they can see eosinophils infiltrating into the esophagus, creating a lot of the inflammation. Remember, eosinophils migrate to areas where there's an allergy present, right? This is one of the reasons why we'll see eosinophilic infiltration into the esophagus. And sometimes it's gluten, but also sometimes it's not necessarily gluten, but it can be a wheat allergy. So if you're, you know, some people are allergic to certain foods and one of the manifestations of that allergic reactivity is an eosinophilic infiltration into the esophagus leading to EE. So again, if you've got that as a diagnosis, you definitely want to look at gluten as a potential possibility. You want to look at wheat allergy also as a potential possibility. Remember, some they're not the same thing. Some doctors will test you for wheat allergy but won't test you for gluten sensitivity. And some doctors will test you for gluten sensitivity but won't test you for wheat allergy. And some of the tests for gluten sensitivity aren't 100% accurate. So if you're, if you're not getting properly tested, you could miss the boat on this one. And, and you know, what's the side effect or the consequence of getting this diagnosis? For most people, when you have inflammation in the esophagus, which is what this word means, itis means inflammation, um, what, what is commonly given is an antiacid medication. So an antacid is generally prescribed something like a, you know, a Nexium or, or um, other antiacid or antacid medications are prescribed. 
because it's the common thought process that, hey, you've got this inflammation. It's because acid reflux. Let's suppress your acid. Well, for many people, it's not acid reflux at all. It's actually inflammation caused as a result of what you're eating. And if it's gluten or wheat allergy or even another food allergy can do this too. It's, you know, other foods can create this problem too. And you've never actually had a doctor test you for those different things. Be very, very smart to ask and have that conversation. Then we get to number three on the list. And number three, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. So gastritis, again, you see that word itis. Again, anytime you see that at the end of a word, it just simply, it means inflammation, right? So gastroesophageal reflux disease. Same kind of thing here. A lot of times, person gets a diagnosis, the doctor is going to recommend an antacid medication to treat the, again, the reflux or what is perceived to be a reflux. So I think it's important to understand perception of symptoms versus actuality of where the symptoms come from. So when most people have heartburn, right? They get pressure, they can get pain, they can get uh, phlegm in their throat. Sometimes it can be harder to swallow. Like these are all symptoms of what doctors perceive to be gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease or gastritis. Now, although those symptoms can manifest with gastric reflux, they can also manifest with food induced. So we, was talking about, we were talking about this earlier, food induced inflammation. Food induced itis, if you will, food induced inflammation. And so if your doctor hears you saying, hey, I'm having these symptoms and says, oh, let's give you an antacid, but doesn't ask the question whether or not um, your diet is potentially creating this problem and looking at food as a potential culprit here, you may be missing the boat. Now, bacterial infections can also cause gastritis as well. So if you've ever heard of H. pylori, it's another, it's another you know, type of issue that can contribute to gastritis. So a lot of times doctors, when, when somebody has persistent chronic GERD, doctor will test you for H. pylori, but they won't test you for food-induced inflammation. And it's always important to rule that food piece out. Remember, there's really only a couple of things that can cause inflammation along the GI tract, okay, if we, if we really want to oversimplify it. Number one is microbial imbalances. So, so bacteria, fungal, yeast, et cetera, those types of things. So in this example here, H. pylori would be one of those examples of microbial imbalance. But number two would be what you eat, right? So, so that could be that you're reacting to the food itself. It could be that you're reacting to the ingredients within the packaged or processed food. So, you know, there are a number of different chemicals now today found in your, in your run of the mill products from the grocery store, whether it be food preservatives, food additives, food colorings, food dyes, synthetic flavoring agents, uh, uh, chemicals like MTG or microbial transglutaminase, AKA meat glue. These can all create for some people a, an irritation within the GI tract. So again, it's important again, not to just ignore this aspect. And if you're negative for H. pylori, take the antacid. Cause we're going to talk in just a minute. Stay with me. We're going to talk why just taking that antacid might be a terrible idea for you. Okay. So that's, we're up to three. Let's get to number four. And this, you know, hopefully most of you have heard of this, and that's celiac disease. Celiac disease is basically inflammation of the small intestine, right? The duodenum jejunum ileum, the area of your small intestine, that's a 22-foot section of your small, or of your entire GI tract, rather. And celiac disease is what happens is when a doctor can identify on a scope or a biopsy something called villus atrophy. Now, villus atrophy is not unique to gluten, meaning other things can cause villus atrophy. Um, if you've heard the term celiac disease, um, it, generally this is in reference to gluten, but there's also, but it's not always in reference to gluten because there's also sprue, tropical sprue, which can be caused by a parasite. So a parasite can cause villus atrophy. Again, this is a microbial imbalance, right? So the inflammation that manifests here in the small intestine. But we can also have other things. For example, in science, research has shown that uh, corn, soy, and other foods can also cause villus atrophy. So just because you had a scope and your doctor has identified the villus atrophy, 
generally the scope is not enough to call it celiac disease. Usually you also have to have the presence of antibodies against certain types of gluten for the doctor to be able to confidently say, hey, you've got celiac disease. So to diagnose celiac disease, a gastroenterologist or other doctor would say, okay, you've got a combo of villus atrophy, but you've also got antibodies to gluten or gliadin, and the combination of those two things along with your symptoms is what generally leads to manifestation of the diagnosis here. But we know gluten causes celiac disease. It's a, one of the primary causes of celiac disease. Certainly we know there are other components to trigger. We've talked about how Teflon can contribute to an increased risk for the development of celiac disease. We've talked about how antibiotics can increase the risk for the development of celiac disease. We've talked about how other foods and other medications can increase that risk too. So it's not just about gluten, although gluten is the common hallmark, okay, when, when we do discuss celiac disease. And now let's get it, moving on to number five here. Number five, ulcerative colitis. Now, this is inflammation in the left large intestine. And although ulcerative colitis has more than one cause, generally it's, it's in most cases that I've ever seen, ulcerative colitis gluten is always an issue, but another big issue is dairy here. So if you struggle with gastrointestinal inflammation and you're consuming a lot of dairy uh, and you're gluten-free, you might consider adding this or asking your doctor to measure for this component because these two go hand in hand. Another one is sugar, plays a big role here, and then also with that processed food. Processed food is a very, very common trigger for ulcerative colitis. So these, I call these the kind of the trifecta, the dairy, the sugar, the processed food, beyond the gluten that is. So you've got these things that are major culprits involved in the development of ulcerative colitis. And certain bacteria can also do this as well. For example, there's a type of bacterial imbalance called C. diff or Clostridium difficile, which is a type of bacteria. And, and generally, these, these type of bacteria like, like to live in hospitals. So if you've ever been in a hospital and stayed in a hospital, these love to hang out in the hospitals. And some people pick up C. diff when they, when they visit the hospital for other reasons. And so again, it's a, it's a known contributing factor to the development of ulcerative colitis, uh, aside from gluten. And then we have Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, which is a, an inflammatory disease of the right side of the large intestine, named after B.B. Crone, one of the early doctors who actually discovered the, the unique types of lesions that manifested in Crohn's disease. But the same thing applies with ulcerative colitis as Crohn's, as we generally will see dairy, sugar, processed food, and gluten playing the biggest contributing role here. What happens in these two conditions, so with these two, the, the, again, they're about location. One's the right side, one's the left side. But the big issue between these two, there's a lot of overlap, but um, with these conditions, what happens is the inflammation gets so bad, like the GI tract, the inflammation in these two areas gets so bad that it manifests as severe, severe diarrhea and, gas and, and bleeding through the GI tract, so bleeding out in the stool. And so anemia starts to set in and, and tremendous fatigue and anemia leads to an inability to heal. So these individuals, when they're really, really severe, get in this scenario, it's kind of like a catch-22. Their, their guts uh, are chronically uh, struggling with diarrhea and so they can't retain their water, so they can't stay hydrated. They're also having blood come out and they're massively iron depleted. And so they can't get adequate oxygen to their tissue. And so you need fluid and you need oxygen in order to heal and repair these areas. And so what happens is these people get in real binds and that's where a lot of times doctors will recommend steroids or non anti-inflammatories or other medications to get that inflammation under control. And you may, be, you may be watching this thinking, hey, that's me, that's what happened with me. My doctor gave me those things. But now you're at a point where it's relatively, possibly relatively stable. You're on a steroid or something to suppress that inflammation. Now it's time to start looking for the triggers. So identifying triggers is more important in the long run. In the short run, sometimes you do have to get it under control and a doctor may need to prescribe you a medicine um, but you've got to go backwards now and identify what those triggers are. Okay, so that's number, again, number five and number six here. We kind of did them together. And then number seven, diverticulitis. Now, diverticula are kind of weakening in the walls of the intestine. It, so think of it like a tire. Have you ever seen a tire on a bicycle or even a car bubble out where, where the tire itself kind of pushes out? Well, the wall of the intestine itself can get an outpouching 
and that outpouching is called a diverticuli. Now, if it's inflamed, they call it diverticulitis. If it's not inflamed, it's generally called diverticulosis. Um, but what happens is, is you're eating your food, little debris from the food as you're chewing, they kind of store in that little pouch, and then bacteria get in there and you can get an infection. Sometimes that's what creates it to become irritated, and sometimes it's just food reactivity. So you get food that gets stuck in there and you're reacting to that food or an infection can set in, and that can create a major problem. Now, the weakening of the lining of the intestine, these little weak outpouchings that can occur, are direct response from chronic inflammation. So the longer you've got chronic inflammation, the greater the risk at developing these things. And so what sometimes has to happen, sometimes what doctors will recommend are, are diets more liquid based or low residue diets where you're, you're not eating things like nuts or seeds or, nut, uh, or, or, or food that has the ability again to, to kind of not properly fully break down and then the little particulate gets stuck in that area. So diverticulitis, another one we know that gluten can contribute to. And the number eight are the hemorrhoids. Now, gluten by itself um, can cause hemorrhoids. I've seen a number of people who had uh, severe chronic hemorrhoid issues go away when they changed their diet and went gluten-free. Um, so we know that gluten can definitely contribute to hemorrhoids, but so can other things. So if you've, if you've ever had a child, women, if you've ever had a child, you know that, that the, the increased pressure right from that baby sometimes increases the risk for the development of hemorrhoids as well as so does chronic constipation. Of course, we know gluten can cause for many people. It's not always causing diarrhea. A lot of times it causes the opposite of that, which is chronic constipation, which increases the risk for developing hemorrhoids as well. So again, these are the eight ways we know that gluten can create an inflammatory process within the GI tract. Um, all of them, you know, simply put, uh, if we look toward diet change as a, as a predominant mechanism uh, to help get these things under control, you're going to be doing yourself a huge, huge favor. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.